This is part two of the AC course in which we'll be discussing component identification and function. And by the end of the class, you will be able to understand this picture. This is part two of our AC course here, and this is going to be the practical portion. And it's not going to be just me talking about the basics behind it the whole time. We're going to be going over component identification, the location of the components, and how they work, and some basic troubleshooting. And I just want to jump into the video. Uh, before we do that, I want to say thank you to Ryan and Lee for donations at adeptape at yahoo.com on PayPal, and on to the video. So we're going to be using this picture quite often in this video, and the reason is because it explains your entire AC system. And looking at it, it seems pretty simple, and that's because your AC system is pretty simple. There's really only five components on your AC system, and that goes on pretty much all manufacturers. Whether you have a Peterbilt, Freightliner, if it's a bus, if it's a car, pretty much systems are all the same. So the first component is your AC compressor. Then after that, the refrigerant enters the condenser, which is similar to a small radiator. And then it travels from there to some sort of a restriction. In this setup, it's going to be an orifice tube. There are a couple other types, but we're predominantly going to be talking about an orifice tube. Then it moves to your evaporator. And then after that, to an accumulator. Now, not all systems have accumulators. Some have something called a receiver dryer, but we'll talk about the differences on that a little bit but really this is the simplest system and the principles are pretty much all the same so now we're going to go into where these components are located on a vehicle so we have a cat engine here and a peterbilt and we're going to start with your ac compressor which is ran off the serpentine belt and then we're going to follow the line coming out of the ac compressor which will be the smaller line and it's gonna follow us to in front of the radiator to our condenser, which is this small looking radiator here. You can see the steel line going into it, the fins, and then there's a steel line coming out on the bottom. And we're gonna follow that line. So here's our steel line. It is the hard metal one. Going back to our condenser there. So let's follow this line. It's gonna run along the frame rail here and try to avoid all of the extremely hot components then we're going to trace it up to the firewall and this is where it ends up we have a switch and then it's going to go into here now this is where your orifice tube but this is where it goes from the high side to the low side now behind there is your evaporator and then we're going to follow the ac line coming out of the firewall now you notice the tubing coming out of the firewall is larger and this is the cold side or the low pressure side and we're going to follow it along the firewall and it's going to go over to the accumulator which is covered in dirt and we'll discuss that later as well that's very important now we're going to follow the accumulator which is still covered in dirt and it has a line coming out of it as well and then that line if we follow it along the valve cover here following the line it's going to come back over and back into your AC compressor. Hey, back to this picture. Now, I hope you like this picture because we're going to be looking at it here for a few minutes. And the reason is this simple picture is going to explain pretty much how the AC system works. Now, hopefully you watched the first portion of the video where we discuss the principles between how temperature changes based on pressure, how pressure can affect boiling point, various other principles. Now, one quick principle I want to go over first is, remember the AC system is trying to remove heat, not necessarily temperature. Um, there's a difference. Heat is a volume of energy, whereas temperature is just how much temperature is in a small item. The best way to think about it is a candle. A candle has a very high temperature. It's very hot. However, one candle, even though the fire portion of the candle might be 
400 degrees, 600 degrees, cannot heat your entire house. However, your heater, which is putting out maybe 100 degree air, so it's much cooler than the candle burning, will warm your entire house because it's putting out more heat volume. I hope, you, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so let's start back at the AC compressor. So what is an AC compressor? Well, it is a gas compressor, similar kind of to an air compressor. And what it has inside of it is usually a set of pistons that are going to compress the gas that is the refrigerant. Now the refrigerant can be a liquid as well, but that's based on the pressure and the temperature. Now you'll notice that we have an arrow with LP gas and HP gas. The HP is high pressure gas and the LP is low pressure gas going into and out of the compressor. The compressor is not designed to compress liquids. Only gas should enter and exit the compressor. Now, why do you need an AC compressor? Well, something has to move this refrigerant as well as increase the pressure of it on the high pressure side to make it travel through the system. Now the compressor is almost always belt driven and it is really the only component that has moving parts so it's going to be the component that is going to fail the most often. Now moving on from the compressor, so your refrigerant in your system as you can see it's a closed loop there's no reason that refrigerant should be entering or exiting the system unless you have a leak. So the refrigerant is at a static pressure, and that static pressure is usually a couple PSI higher than whatever the ambient temperature is. So if it's 80 degrees out, your refrigerant is going to be, you know, about 90 PSI, maybe 100 PSI. There's actually a chart that will show you what the appropriate pressure is. That high pressure gas leaving the compressor is always going to be higher than that static pressure it should be. So say it's 150 or 200 PSI coming out of the compressor. It's then going to go through the condenser, which is in front of the radiator. And what it's doing on the condenser is air is going across the condenser and it is pulling heat out of that refrigerant. And the refrigerant is hotter than the outside air because it's been compressed and that has raised the temperature of the gas because the heat in the gas has been compressed. Okay. Okay, so the high pressure, high temperature gas, that's why it's also red in color, has gone through the condenser and it has had cooler than the refrigerant temperature air pass over it from the outside air temperature, from the outside air. And that has cooled down the refrigerant by passing the air across the condenser. Now, remember that temperature and pressure play a part together. So as the cooler air is passed over the condenser, the refrigerant has the heat pulled out of it, and most of the refrigerant is going to turn into a high pressure liquid. Now that's why it's called a condenser. Uh, what is the moisture that forms on a cold glass called? Condensation. So moisture that is in a gas state is turning into a liquid. It's condensing. Hence, we're going from a high pressure gas to a high pressure liquid through the condenser. Now the condenser is where the heat in the refrigerant is also lost. The entire part of the rest of the system, heat is not lost from the refrigerant. Heat is only gained in the evaporator, but we'll get to that later. So we have high pressure, hot liquid coming out of the condenser. It's then going to go to the restriction, which in this system, which is a cycling clutch compressor, compressor system, is going to be an orifice tube. Now there's not much to say about an orifice tube. It's an orifice is basically a small opening and it has a screen over it to catch any debris that has come through from the compressor or from the accumulator that has passed through the compressor and the condenser. 
Now this is the point at which the high pressure liquid is going to change states and it's going to turn to a low pressure liquid because you have a restriction. So what the restriction does is it causes the high pressure to be forced through the small orifice, but then on the other side, there's a larger volume area because the tubes are bigger, you have your evaporator, and you have suction side from the compressor. So it's a low pressure area. You're talking anywhere from 20 to 40 PSI up or below, you know, that's a lot less than the high pressure side, which you're talking anywhere from, you know, about 150 up to 250 PSI. Now, that gas coming out of the orifice tube is going to be a liquid and gas mixture, and it's going to flow from the orifice tube into the evaporator. Now, every part past the orifice tube until it get back to the compressor is your low pressure side. And when the system is on, meaning the compressor is running, all those tubes and all those components should be cold to the touch. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, so we have this low pressure liquid gas mix. That's going to go into your evaporator, which is behind your firewall. And this is also a small radiator-like device but it's usually much smaller than the condenser. And what is going to happen here is this very cold refrigerant is going to get passed through the coils of the evaporator. And then the outside air is going to be brought in or it can be recycled from inside the cab. It's going to be passed along through the fins of the evaporator, which will be much colder than the outside air. And it's going to draw the heat from the air because the evaporator is very cold. It's, uh, it's almost close to freezing. Usually it's about 40 degrees or so. And remember, the point, the end point of your AC system is to get the air in the cab cold. So this is the point where that air is getting cooled. So the air is passing through the evaporator. The cold refrigerant is pulling the heat out of the air so the air is going to get colder because it's losing heat energy through the evaporator into the refrigerant now remember what happens when heat is injected into a liquid if enough of it's there it's going to turn more into a gas and what's that called evaporization so we have our evaporator you know the if you look at the names they kind of explain what they do so the refrigerant is mostly going to turn from the low pressure liquid with some gas in it to almost all low pressure gas at this point because it's drawing heat from the air. It's going to evaporate into a gas. But remember, this is a closed system. It's not like evaporating moisture from a pan where it just goes into the air. It's evaporating and then it's going into the line. Now, there's something called an accumulator next after this. And the accumulator's only, well, it has two purposes. There's desiccant in the accumulator, and that's to draw any moisture that may have entered the system when it was, when it was getting charged. Um, no moisture, I mean no water moisture, should be in this system. And the other por portion that the accumulator does is it holds AC volume, but it also is preventing liquids getting into the compressor. It's basically just an aluminum can and only gas can enter the compressor. So what the accumulator does is it has an opening at the top and basically only gas can pass through because liquids will basically just sit on the bottom of the accumulator and hopefully evaporate and then turn into gases and then go back into your compressor. So that's your AC cycle right there. That explains what all the components do and how they work and basically how the system works. Now we're gonna get back to the truck and I'm gonna show you a few more things. So you might be wondering, okay, wise guys, so this is a closed system. There isn't really like a radiator cap where you just pour more refrigerant into. So how do you test the pressures? How do you charge these systems? Well, if you're familiar, 
there are, and you would have seen it in the previous video, there's two fittings that are on the AC system. There is a high side and a low side test port. And they're in different locations because obviously they can't both be in the same location. And you're gonna hook up to them to refill or check your pressures. So here we are hooking up a high side test port. It's going to be on the smaller tube because that's the high side. And you can't interchange these. The blue, the low side, and the red high side are not interchangeable because the tubes are different sizes they connect to. So you're gonna put these fittings on if you have an AC machine or test gauges, and then you screw the valve open, and it will let you tap into this system. Now we're using an AC machine here, which is very expensive. Most people are gonna have these. So let's stay looking at this picture here. You can see that there is a high side and a low side indicated by the red and the blue. And the system is not currently running, but it is hooked up to. And you can see they're both at about 80 PSI. When the system's been off for a little bit, the static pressures are gonna be about the same because the pressure differential between both sides of the orifices is going to even out. Now it was about 75 degrees in the shop today and our pressure was a little over 80. So always remember it should be a little bit above static temperature. Okay, so you might be wondering, okay, we've covered the components, but what about the electrical side? Are there switches? Well, yes, there are. There's usually two or three switches in your AC system. And what are these doing? Well, on a cycling clutch system, there's usually three switches. However, there can be things called trinary switches that are basically multiple in one. But there's usually a fan switch that if the high side pressure gets too high, will kick on your cooling fan that will help drop the high side pressure. There's also a high side pressure switch normally and a low side pressure switch normally. And what these are doing is trying to cycle the cycling compressor clutch. And what that does is it basically turns your compressor on and off, similar to a clutch in a transmission. And what it's doing is it's trying to keep the refrigerant in a pressure range so that it produces the optimal cooling. Now you might be wondering, how am I supposed to know how much refrigerant to put in the system? Now there's also oil in the system and the oil is to lubricate the compressor. But without this data tag, this is a Peterbilt data tag, and if no matter what vehicle you're working on, new from the factory, we'll have a tag like this. And it should tell you the, the correct refrigerant charge amount. And you should not add more or less than the system quantity specified by the manufacturer. Now what determines the amount? Well, that's based on the size of the compressor, condenser, length of the hoses, size of the accumulator. Um, that also ties in with the size of the cab it's trying to cool. Is this a day cab? Does it have a sleeper cab? I mean, if you've ever seen a bus AC compressor system, it holds a whole lot more than two pounds. And all that ties in with the efficiency of the system and how it's designed. You will not be engineering these AC systems, but you will be fixing them and it's always good to know the correct amount to charge the system with. Now this has pretty much gone over the entire AC system and this video is already getting into almost 20 minutes long so we're gonna have to go over troubleshooting in part three of truck AC troubleshooting.